Hey guys, Cam Woodfin here again, ready to read you the fourth installment of The Little Prince. We're going to pick up on chapter 18. The Little Prince crossed the desert and encountered only one flower, a flower with three petals, a flower of no consequence. Good morning, said the Little Prince. Good morning, said the flower. Where are the people, the Little Prince inquired politely. The flower had, all, had seen a caravan one day passing. People? There are six or seven of them, I believe, in existence. I caught sight of them years ago, but you never know where to find them. The wind blows them away. They have no roots, which hampers them a good deal. Goodbye, said the little prince. Goodbye, said the flower. And there's the flower he was talking to. The little prince climbed a high mountain. The only mountains he had ever known were the three volcanoes which came up to his knee. And he used the extinct volcano as a footstool. From a mountain as high as this one, he said to himself, I'll get a view of the whole planet and all the people on it. But he saw nothing but rocky peaks as sharp as needles. Hello, he said just in case. Hello, hello, hello. The echo answered. Who are you? asked the little prince. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? The echo answered. Let's be friends. I'm lonely, he said. I'm lonely. I'm lonely. I'm lonely. The echo answered. What a peculiar planet, he thought. It's all dry and sharp and hard, and people here have no imagination. They repeat whatever you say to them. Where I live, I had a flower. She always spoke first. But it so happened that the little prince, having walked a long time through sand and rocks and snow, finally discovered a road, and all roads go where the people are. Good morning, he said. It was, blossom it was a blossoming rose garden. Good morning, said the roses. The little prince gazed at them. All of them looked like his flower. Who are you? he asked, astounded. We are roses, the roses said. Ah, said the little prince, and he felt very unhappy. His flower had told him she was the only one of her kind in the whole universe. And here were five thousand of them, all just alike, in just one garden. And there's a picture of the little prince kneeling on top of the mountain. And here's a picture of all the roses. She would be very annoyed, he said to himself, if she saw this. She would cough terribly and pretend to be dying to avoid being laughed at, and I'd have to pretend to be nursing her. Otherwise, she'd really let herself die in order to humiliate me. And then he said to himself, I thought I was, a rich, be I thought I was rich because I had just one flower, and all I own is an ordinary rose. And then that and my three volcanoes, which came up to my knee, one of which may be permanently extinct, doesn't make me much of a prince. And he lay down in the grass and wept. It was then that the fox appeared. Good morning, said the fox. Good morning, the little prince answered politely, though when he turned around he saw nothing. I'm here, the voice said, under the apple tree. Who are you, the little prince asked. You're very pretty. I'm a fox, the fox said. Come and play with me, the little prince proposed. I'm feeling so sad. I can't play with you, the fox said. I am not tamed. Ah, excuse me, said the little prince. But upon reflection, he added, what does tamed mean? You're not from around here, the fox said. What are you looking for? I'm looking for people, said the little prince. What does tamed mean? People, said the fox, have guns and they hunt. It's quite troublesome. And they also raise chickens. That's the only interesting thing about them. Are you looking for chickens? There's the little prince talking to the fox. No, said the little prince. I'm looking for friends. What does tamed mean? It's something that's been too often neglected. It means to create ties. To create ties. That's right, the fox said. For me, you're only a little boy, just like a hundred thousand other little boys. And I have no need of you. And you have no need of me either. For you, I'm only a fox like a hundred thousand other foxes. But if you tame me, we'll need each other. You'll be the only boy in the world for me. I'll be the only fox in the world for you. I'm beginning to understand, the little prince said. There's a flower. I think she's tamed me. Possibly, the fox said. On earth, one sees all kinds of things. Oh, this isn't on earth, the little prince said. The fox seemed quite intrigued. On another planet? Yes. Are there hunters on that planet? M one, no. Now that's interesting. And chickens? No. Nothing's perfect, sighed the fox, but he returned to this idea. My life is monotonous. I hunt chickens, people hunt me, all chickens are just alike, and all men are just alike, so I'm rather bored. 
But if you tame me, my life will be filled with sunshine. I'll know the sound of footsteps that will be different from all the rest. Other footsteps send me back underground. Yours will call me out of my burrow like music. And then, look! You see the wheat fields over there? I don't eat bread. For me, wheat is of no use whatsoever. Wheat fields say nothing to me, which is sad. But you have hair the color of gold, so it will be wonderful once you've tamed me. The wheat, which is golden, will remind me of you, and I'll love the sound of the wind and the wheat. The fox fell silent and stared at the little prince for a long while. Please, tame me, he said. I'd like to, the little prince replied, but I haven't much time. I have friends to find and so many things to learn. The only things you learn are the things you tame, said the fox. People haven't time to learn anything. They buy things ready-made in stores, but since there are no stores where you can buy friends, people no longer have friends. If you want a friend, tame me. What do I have to do? asked the little prince. You have to be very patient, the fox answered. First, you'll sit down a little ways away from me, over there in the grass. I'll watch you out of the corner of my eye and won't say anything. Language is a source of misunderstandings. But day by day, you'll be able to sit a little bit closer. The next day, the little prince returned. It would have been better to return at the same time, the fox said. For instance, if you come at four in the afternoon, I'll begin to be happy by three. The closer it gets to four, the happier I'll feel. By four, I'll be all excited and worried. I'll discover what it costs to be happy. But if you come at any old time, I'll never know when I should prepare my heart. There must be rights. What's a uh, right? asked the little prince. That's another thing that's been too often neglected, said the fox. It's the fact that one day is different from the other days, one hour from the other hours. My hunters, for example, have a right. They dance with the village girls on Thursdays, so Thursday's a wonderful day. I can take a stroll all the way to the vineyards. If the hunters danced whenever they chose, the days would be all alike, and I'd have no holiday at all. That was how the little prince tamed the fox. When the time to leave was near, ah, the fox said, I shall weep. It's your own fault, the little prince said. I never wanted to do you any harm, but you insisted that I tame you. Yes, of course, the fox said. But you're going to weep, said the little prince. Yes, of course, the fox said. Then you get nothing out of it? I get something, the fox said. Because of the color of the wheat, then he added. Go look at the roses. Go look at the roses again. You'll understand that yours is the only rose in all the world. Then come back to say goodbye and I'll make you the gift of a secret. There's the fox in his little burrow. The little prince went to look at the roses again. You're not at all like my rose. You're nothing at all yet, he told them. No one has tamed you, and you haven't tamed anyone. You're the way my fox was. He was just a fox, like a hundred thousand others. But I've made him my friend. And now he's the only fox in all the world. And the roses were humbled. You're lovely, but you're empty, he went on. One couldn't die for you. Of course, an, an ordinary passerby wouldn't think my rose looked just like you. Would think my rose looked just like you. But my rose, all on her own, is more important than all of you together, since she's the one I've watered. Since she's the one I put under glass. Since she's the one I sheltered behind a screen. Since she's the one whom I killed the caterpillars, except the two or three for butterflies. Since she's the one I listened to when she complained, or when she boasted, or even sometimes when she said nothing at all. Since she's my rose. And he went on, back to the fox. Goodbye, he said. Goodbye, said the fox. Here's my secret. It's quite simple. One sees clearly only with the heart. Anything essential is invisible to the eyes. Anything essential is invisible to the eyes, the little prince repeated, in order to remember. It's the time you spent on your rose that makes your rose so important. It's the time I spent on my rose, the little prince repeated in order to remember. People have forgotten this truth, the fox said, but you mustn't forget it. You become responsible forever for what you've tamed. You're responsible for your rose. I'm responsible for my rose, the little prince repeated, in order to remember. Good morning, said the little prince. Good morning, said the railway switchman. What does he do here? asked the little prince. I sort the travelers into bundles of, th of a thousand, the switchman said. I dispatch the trains that carry them, sometimes to the right, sometimes to the left. And a brightly lit express train, roaring like thunder, shook the switchman's cabin. What a hurry they're in, said the little prince. What are they looking for? 
Not even the engineer on the locomotive knows, said the switchman. And another brightly lit express train thundered by in the opposite direction. Are they coming back already? asked the little prince. It's not the same ones, the switchman said. It's an exchange. They weren't satisfied with where they were? asked the little prince. No one is ever satisfied where he is, the switchman said. And a third brightly lit express train thundered past. Are they chasing the first travelers? asked the little prince. They're not chasing anything, the switchman said. They're sleeping in there, or else they're yawning. Only the children are pressing their noses against the window panes. Only the children know what they're looking for, said the little prince. They spend their time on a rag doll. They spend their time on a rag doll, and it becomes very important. And if it's taken away from them, they cry. They're lucky, the switchman said. Good morning, said the little prince. Good morning, said the sales clerk. This was a sales clerk who sold pills invented to quench thirst. Swallow one a week, and you no longer feel the need to drink. Why do you sell these pills? These pills. They have so much time. They save so much time, the sales clerk said. Experts, experts, I'm so sorry. Experts have calculated that you can save 53 minutes a week. And what do you do with those 53 minutes? Whatever you like. If I had 53 minutes to spend as I liked, the little prince said to himself, I'd walk very slowly toward a water fountain. And that is the end of our fourth installment. We have one more left, and we'll be finishing the book. Hope to see you guys soon.